Now we're going to talk about roots and radicals, starting with some definitions and moving on to operations and ultimately how to solve equations that involve uh, square roots and other types of radicals. Let's start with some definitions. You're probably already familiar with square roots, but the definition of a square root says that b is a square root of a if b squared is equal to a. Let's look at an example to see how that works. If you take the number 16 as our a, and we were trying to identify square roots based on this definition, we would be looking for numbers where if you square them, you end up with 16. If you think about it for a second, you can figure out that 4 is a number that will work here. But it turns out there's actually two numbers that fit this definition. Negative 4, when you square it, also gives you 16. This can be problematic because if you talk about the square root of 16, it can be unclear on the face of it whether you're talking about 4 or negative 4. And so that brings us to the radical notation that we often use with roots. We use this symbol that you're probably familiar with to talk about the principal root of a number. So if I write radical 16, we would read that as the square root of 16. And that's defined to be the positive number, 4. If we wanted to talk about the other possibility using this radical notation, we could put a minus sign out in the front. Negative radical 16, that would be equal to negative 4. Now that we've handled square roots, it's time to tackle other kinds of roots. So let's start with a definition. Notice that the definition of square root involved the squaring operation. But there's nothing special about squaring. We can expand this definition to account for any possible power that we'd like. So we can say that b is an nth root of a if b to the n power equals a. So let's take a number like 8. Suppose we wanted to find a third root of 8. Well, in that case, we would be looking for a number where if we raise it to the third power, we get 8. You think about it for a second, and you figure out that 2 is a number that will work. We can write this fact using a notation that's similar to the notation that we used for square roots a second ago. What we would do is we're still going to use a radical, and we'll still put 8 on the inside. But we have to indicate what kind of a root it is. There are third roots and fourth roots and fifth roots, etc. In this case, we're doing a third root, and so we put that up here in the left corner. We would read this as the third root of 8 equals 2. There's a little bit of terminology to know here. The number in that upper left corner that tells us what kind of root it is is called the index. And the number that is actually inside the radical itself is called the radicand. And just to give you a couple more examples, if we did the fourth root of 256, that happens to be 4. If we did the third root of negative 27, that happens to be negative 3. Now that we've got the basics out of the way, let's talk about a couple of rules that radicals follow when you use them. Uh, things get a little bit hairy when you have negative radicands. So we are only going to consider situations where you have positive numbers under the radical. The first rule that radicals follow has to do with multiplication. And it says that if you have two radicals of the same type, notice these are both nth roots, and you multiply them together, you can multiply the radicands underneath. So for example, suppose that we had the square root of 2 and we were going to multiply it by the square root of 18. Well, this rule says that we can multiply the two radicands, 2 times 18, which gives us the square root of 36. And the square root of 36 is a nice number. It's just 6. Let's look at another example. Suppose we had the third root of 20, and we multiplied that by the third root of 50. Well, again, the rule says that we can multiply the radicands. So this is the third root of 20 times 50, which is the third root of 1,000, 
which is 10. The second rule for radicals is similar to the first, but it applies to division instead of multiplication. And what it says is that if you're doing the root of a fraction, you can split it up and just do the root on the top and the root on the bottom. For example, if we wanted to do the square root of 16 over 9, well, that's going to be the square root of 16 divided by the square root of 9. And both of these are nice numbers. The square root of 16 is 4 and the square root of 9 is 3. This rule also works the other way around. Suppose we wanted to do the third root of 250 divided by the third root of 2. Well, this rule says that we can take those two separate roots and put it together into a single root involving a fraction. So in this case, that would turn into the third root of 250 divided by 2. Well, 250 divided by 2 is 125, so this is the third root of 125, and that happens to be a nice number. It's 5. Now that we've talked about multiplication and division, it's time to talk about addition and subtraction when it comes to radicals. Uh, the bad news here is that addition and subtraction don't play as nicely with radicals as multiplication and division do. For instance, if I wanted to do the square root of 2 plus the square root of 2, your instinct might be to treat that like we did the previous examples and add the radicands, which would be the square root of 4, which of course is 2. Uh, now the bad news here is that this does not work. You can check it on a calculator, but if you add up the square root of 2 plus the square root of 2, it is not equal to 2. The good news here is that radicals do follow the rules of combining like terms, which you are probably familiar with. So for instance, if I wanted to do the square root of 2 plus the square root of 2, it's similar to how you would add x plus x. If I wanted to do x plus x, so I have 1x plus 1x gives us 2x. Same idea here. 1 square root of 2 plus another square root of 2 is 2 square roots of 2. So let's try out the example we have listed here. What we're looking at is 3 root 5 plus 6 root 5 minus 2 root 7. So we need to identify what are the like terms. Well, we have a root 5 here and a root 5 here. These two terms can be combined and you add them just like you would add any variables. 3 plus 6 is 9, so this would give us 9 root 5 minus 2 root 7. At this point, we have done as much as we can. The root 5 here and the root 7 here are not like terms, and so we won't be able to combine them any further. We would just leave it as, as is. One last thing to note is that in order to be like terms, a radical has to have both the same radicand and also the same index. So um, this is an example of two radicals that have a different radicand. But we could also look at an example like the square root of 2 plus the third root of 2. In this case, the radicands are the same. They're both 2. But the indices are different. The index on a square root is 2, because it comes from the squaring operation. And the index on a third root is 3. Since those don't match up, we won't be able to combine these two terms.